whether it's through Twitter, whether it's through, you know, social networking is, is so wonderful. And I had to mention, Dr. Ellen, that I met you through social, you know, through social networking, just saying, hey, you've got a great story. I like, you know, I love the site. We want to have you on. And, you know, the fact that, yes, you are a mom, but, you know, with all your credentials, I want to talk to you about, you know, those those hot topics. We would talk about, you know, we, we, the kids are kind of back from back to school. You know, they're, they're sinking in. They're back in school. But we want to talk about, you know, the, the juice boxes. We want to talk about, you know, childhood obesity. We want to talk about, you know, what should we be doing as parents to make sure that we get our kids to college? Because, you know, you got so right. many people that are – that aren't making it there. You know, I have a lot of friends that, you know, they aren't even hitting 40 years old and I'm going to, you know, it's, it's kind of sad. So without further ado, I want to turn it over to you and, and just, let's just talk about childhood obesity. Sure. Well, not to make a pun, but it is a really big problem. I mean, it's really increased from 1980. We had about 7% of kids were obese. And now, you know, it's really skyrocketed. So we have about a third of kids, you know, who are obese or overweight. So in the last 30 years, it really has increased tremendously. And it's a big problem. The percentage of adolescents, you know, kids who are 12 to 19 is increased from 5% to 21% for obesity. So it's, you know, it's catching up with the adults. And as you said, Ted, you know, what's happening in kids' eating habits now is going to predict where they're at when they're 40, both because they're laying the groundwork for healthy or ill bodies and also they're laying eating habits. So it's really important right. um, that you teach your kids healthy habits and that you help them have a healthy body starting now. But what's hey, really I want- exciting, I think, is when, when when families decide to do it together. I mean, so many times I'll have, yes. you know, a mom call me and she'll say, you know, I was in the dressing room. I had one mother, you know, a week ago called me. Her daughter was so upset she was in Old Navy and nothing fit. And this is like a nine-year-old girl, and she wasn't able to fit into kids' clothing, and she was in tears. And, you know, we got together as a family, and they're starting to change their habits, and they're really jazzed and excited about it. So I think if one huge takeaway is if you want to change your eating habits, make it fun, make it exciting, make Make it positive. It shouldn't be this drag of a diet. I'm actually extremely anti-diet, and on Smasher Scale, I really work to get people off diets and onto lifelong healthy eating habits. Dr. Allen, I, I, I got to stop you right there because I got to say, I have a problem. Let's just say a, a loved one would say, oh, I'm on a cabbage soup diet. And I'm like, well, what happens in 30 days when you stop eating this cabbage soup and the, the 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 weight starts to come back on, you know. Right, and it, what about how your house smells when you're on the cabbage soup diet? That's a really <laughs> scary one. Um, but the worst thing parents can do is put their kids on a diet because what happens is when you're on a diet, you get hungry. And, you know, the hunger gets overwhelming, and then what happens is you binge. So you start this vicious cycle where you're upset, you want to lose weight, and you, and the diet industry plays right into that because they offer people magic bullets. They do the, you know, the 30 pounds in 30 days, take this pill, and none of that stuff works. If it works, we wouldn't have the obesity problem that we have now. So you start this vicious cycle where... You deprive yourself of food, and actually that creates both psychological stress and it raises the stress hormone cortisol. Because if you think back how people evolved, if you were starving, your body got stressed out and really focused on nothing but food. So if you're dieting, all you can do is focus on food. You feel stressed out. You feel horrible. And then what do you do after a week or two of dieting? You go and you binge. You gain the weight back plus some more, and you just go into this vicious cycle. So dieting is really not the thing to do if you want to lose weight. Dr. Ellen, tell me your thoughts on, you know, hey, I see this in the store. You can get the, 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 the juice packs. You can get, a, you know, a box of 10 for a dollar eighty-eight, And you know what? I'm going to send my child with two juices a day. Uh, what am I doing? Am, am I hurting that child? Am I helping them? And, and uh, you know, I mean, I know it's high fructose, but... Right. What's what's the um, other effect well, from that? Yeah, I'm I'm not a big fan of the juice boxes because you're not getting the nutrition that you would get in whole food. 
and you know if you had an apple it's not going to fill you up you're not going to get all of the fiber and all of the nutrients that you would so i mean i my big thing is you know either either do low fat milk or may you know kids love milk schools all carry milk or do water i'm not a huge fan as as you said the juice boxes really are a lot of concentrated calories that kids don't need so it's not it's not a good idea i would stick to water i would stick to milk gotcha gotcha so tell us um, you know, for your your youngest child, that you're you're um you're, you're packing their lunch, give us some insight into what you pack for the day for 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 your child. Sure. Um. Well, he's a big fan of sandwiches. You know, so I usually um you know sandwiches are leftover. So if I, for example, if I make um you know a roast chicken or you know if we made some healthy low fat macaroni and cheese with some broccoli he might take some leftovers of that or i might you know get him some uh luncheon meat such as turkey with some cut of veggies on the side a piece of fruit and you know and something fun i mean it's fine to have you know a pack of cookie in there food should be fun i'm all for kids enjoying what they're eating but you really want to try to um eat real foods, you want to try to provide them with fruits and vegetables, um, and you really want to try to keep away from the highly processed, you know, salty, sweet foods that so many of us are addicted to. Gotcha. So, but he also does school lunch a lot. I mean, school lunch is trying to do a better job. So, I mean, the, you know, Michelle Obama has stepped in, and there, there actually are new laws that are trying to switch to healthier lunches because a lot of kids get about 50% of their calories from school meals. So, you know, you can see what your school system is like, but school lunches are trying to do a better job. Okay. Tell us about SmashYourScale.com because – from looking at it, from I, I, I tell you this much: when I was checking your your Twitter handle, I immediately went to the site and I said, "Boy, this is interesting." Tell right, me well, about Smash Scale. Sure. Well, I created SmashYourScale dot com because, frankly, I've ha- I've had it with the diet industry. I actually was part of the diet industry. I've been a dietitian for twenty one years, and so I used to put people on diets. And then, as I was becoming a psychologist, really studying the destructive nature of diets, and also studying body image and uh, learning new therapies to help women feel good about their bodies and themselves, I really wanted to come up with a way that was inexpensive that I could work with women. So basically, what the site is, it's it's for women, if you want to lose weight, it's great, but it's really if you're looking to change your eating habits, you want motivation, you want accountability, you want advice, you want coaching. So basically what the site does is um, members for only fourteen ninety five a month, members actually get to work with me live through webinar conferencing. So I kind of was looking for a way where I've been working with people one-on-one for years, but I wanted to provide a simple, effective way to reach out pr- primarily to women and to help them lose weight the right way, to learn how to eat when they're hungry, stop when they're full, make peace with food, make peace with their bodies. And I've also been a personal fitness trainer, so you know, putting the fitness angle in there as well. So that's really why I, I created SmashYourScale.com because you know, for women, if you want to have a healthy family, you've got to be an example yourself. So if you want your kids to eat right, it really starts with you eating right. And I feel like people feel so overwhelmed with so many diets out there, and I really am um, using the site to tell people the truth about healthy eating and being well and really to make it a positive experience. That's excellent. That's excellent because, I, I you know, you, you look at the diet industry and it's like whether it's 11 o'clock at night or 3 o'clock in the morning, all the different infomercials on and hey like you said take this magic pill you're going to lose 40 pounds in in the next week and you're sitting there like people really can't believe this but i, I you know for some reason i think they do I yeah really it's a 61 billion dollar industry so people are buying wow. into the the diet stuff cuz you know everybody wants to get it off quick and unfortunately it just I, takes time i usually tell people you know Give yourself, you know, six months. Give yourself a year. Just lose a pound, half a pound a week. And and actually, I tell people, don't focus on weight loss. The minute you start focusing on the weight loss, 
you're setting yourself up for kind of this, this negative thought process. Focus on being healthy. Focus on making little changes every week and enjoying the process, new recipes, new ways to, to move, you know, get out and hike with your family. My son and I actually go rock climbing, which is a new thing that we're doing. And, you know, we, we play extra games in the living room. We turn on, you know, the Wii and jump around and have fun, but really enjoy it. I think so much of weight loss is really framed as something that's kind of, you know, a punishment. And I really encourage people to start with taking care of their bodies and enjoying being alive. Right, right. And I mean, I think you hit up you hit upon a good point is you're on the Wii, you're going rock climbing, so you're moving. You know, you're you're staying active and that's going to take off the pounds. So I mean right. it's it's wonderful knowing that, you know, that there's sites like smashyourscale.com that can go out there. You can go out there. You can join. You can become a member, have access to the literature that's out there, and also, like you, like you said before, the, the one-on-one. So, there, so tell us real, real briefly about your sessions that you have. Are they 15-minute sessions, 30-minute sessions? Um, the sessions are usually a half an hour, so they're usually 30 minutes. And um, okay. if you remember, sessions are free, so you can attend as many as you would like. And I have sessions from everything from just, you know, virtual coaching, so people can work on their fitness, they can work on their healthy eating habits. Um, I have more sessions that are more geared towards positive weight management and weight loss. Um, I also teach self-compassion, which is basically learning how to be kind to yourself. And it's a real problem for people, particularly moms, because we're so busy giving so much to our kids that we forget to be kind to ourselves and then what happens is we just don't have any energy for anybody let alone you know our kids or ourselves so yeah, what people do is basically when they join they can sign up for sessions and then they can talk one-on-one with me great hey i do have one question can you can sure. you tell the listeners about the i don't really want to say binge eaters what about the 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 classic eaters that are you know that eat really fast what are what are some of the pitfalls of eating quickly while you're at the table let's just say hey i just want to grab something really quick to eat because i want to go catch the game right well the big pitfalls are you're probably going to end up eating more than your body needs because it takes your body about 20 minutes to realize that you're full you're also not going to enjoy your food. You know, if you're just woofing it down, you're not going to give your body what it needs. You're not going to enjoy your food. And generally when people are also grabbing things, they're not really planning and making themselves healthy food. So you're also going to probably compromise in terms of nutrition. Um, so we, one of the things I, I teach on smasherscale.com too is mindful eating or intuitive eating. So really mm-hmm. getting people to, especially, you know, for families, one of the best things families can do is eat as a family at the table, and turn off the television. And it's something, you know, I grew up eating like that, and I do that with my family. But so few families, you know, sit and eat together as a family. And actually, they just came out with a new study that found um, that eating dinner as a family two or three times a week can reduce the risk of obesity um, in young adulthood. So it was a pretty rigorous study. Um, But if that feels overwhelming to you, you know, you can just start also with breakfast too. So I think you raise a really good point, Ted, about the the binge eating. I mean, part of the binge eating too is um, people are using food for emotional reasons um, instead of just using food for what it was meant to, which is to, to nourish and take care of your body and also, you know, and to enjoy, but in the right way. Right, right. I, I know we're at the cusp right now of, of this closing out this interview, interview, but I really would like you to just comment on the family that eats out or eating out when you're part of the program for SmashYourScale.com. Well, sure. I mean, if eating out is part of what you do on a regular basis, I mean, that's fine. I mean, eating out is enjoyable. The thing that I recommend people do if they're really trying to lose weight and be more healthy is, first of all, to choose a restaurant that has healthy options. 
Um, so you you know you want to go somewhere that is going to serve things that are lower in fat and calories and things that you enjoy but are not going to be you know your whole day's worth of calories in one meal. Um, and most most restaurants, particularly chains, you know have the nutrition information. So it's a good idea to before you go choose your restaurant wisely and and decide what you're going to have before you get there because the problem is when you're hungry. Actually, research really shows that your willpower completely collapses. So you can go in there thinking, oh, I'm just going to have, you know, the grilled chicken and the salad and maybe, you know, one breadstick. And what happens is you sit down and you see the, you know, the Alfredo. And if you're hungry, you're, it's very, very difficult for you to make um, smart food decisions. So choose your restaurant, decide what you're going to do ahead of time. And also, you know, think about either using a doggy bag, so just eating half your food and, you know, putting half of it away right away, or split an entree. And there's nothing wrong with, you know, having an appetizer and then splitting an entree with someone and maybe splitting a dessert. So restaurant portions are humongous because that's what people want. So if you're smart about it, you can eat out, you know, without packing on the pounds. Wow. Dr. Allen, I, I want to thank you so much for just enlightening us and, you know, just the audience overall with health and wellness, just eating right and just really, really helpful. I mean, this isn't the last time you're going to come on here. I tell you that much. Because we, we no, definitely I'm happy want to, to come back, Ted, anytime. <laughs> definitely. We're on the so, same time zone, so we're good. Oh, wonderful. Even better. So, Tell us the best way to get in contact with you via social media. Oh, sure. Um, well, you can go to Facebook and just go to Smash Your Scale, and you can get in touch with me there. And actually, I just posted an article about the one I just mentioned about um, family meals, and I, I do do a lot of family-friendly things. My Twitter handle is E.R. Albertson. Um, and you can go to smasherscale.com, where actually the easiest way would just be to go to smasherscale.com, and then you can find links for both my Twitter feed and my Facebook feed, as well as contact information if you just want to contact me, if you have questions about the site, about working with me. Um, I'd love to help you. Definitely, definitely. And Dr. Ellen, I just clicked like on your Facebook page, and after tonight's show, we're going to implore everyone to do the same. Thank you well, so much that. for for just, you know, joining us tonight, and we wanted to give you a round of applause. Well, I appreciate that, Ted. It's it's a pleasure to be on. I love radio. I actually had a radio show for years, so I think radio is fantastic. I thank you. You're doing a great job by providing parents with such actionable information. Thanks so much, and I remember in, in the email you, you mentioned you had a, a a radio show for about five years, and definitely want to definitely have you come back on. Thanks so much, Dr. Allen. My pleasure. Have a great for our our resident CEO and 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 Dr. Bob Ruparver is getting ready to join us. Dr. Bob, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you, sir? Pretty good, pretty good. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. I I, I know um, there was a little bit of back and forth between us and, and PR, so thank you for your, the flexibility in your schedule for joining us tonight. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. So tell us about the new battery life extender technology. I mean, usually when I when I get a battery or – my kids run through the batteries, whether it's a, a a video game or, you know, a game controller. It gets to a point where, hey, they run through the battery, the controller starts to, I guess, get a little sluggish, and we take those batteries and we toss them. But um, after speaking with you, I think there's going to be a, there's going to be a new solution that, that's coming out. So tell us about the inception of your, your, your um, product. I guess there is a, there is a saying saying there is life after death. I think in this case there is for sure <laughs> there is going to be life after death, and we can resurrect those batteries. And it is not that we are really res- resurrecting it. There is tremendous amount of energy still left in the battery as being tossed away, and we just go and harness those energy. And we're saying that uh, consumers should not throw those batteries away because they still have energy. If you have a toothpaste. You buy brand new toothpaste, you squeeze it from the top at the beginning six times, 
Uh, the seventh time you squeeze, nothing comes out of it. You don't throw it away. You don't throw it in the garbage can because you can see there is still plenty of toothpaste left in it. With battery, your device stops working and uh, you put it in a test, uh, you know, a battery tester. It shows red. It says toss it and you throw it away, not knowing there's up to 80% energy still left in it. So we're harnessing those energy and we're just squeezing uh, just all the juice out of the battery so that way you can extend the life of the battery. Uh, it saves consumer tremendous amount of money. Uh, we are shaking up a $15 billion industry, and I'm sure you're aware that uh, every year 15 billion batteries are consumed and thrown in the landfill. Uh, you know, if you stack these batteries uh, right next to each other, you can wrap around the earth uh, almost 19 times. That's what ends up in the, in the landfill, uh, toxic material. Uh, consumers spending multi-billion, $15 billion a year on these batteries, and the energy to produce and manufacture these uh, batteries and transport them around the world, uh, it's not good for the environment because the energy, equivalent energy, would light up uh, all the neon lights of the uh, city of Las Vegas for 75 years. Uh, it puts down 1.2 million tons of CO2 every year that you're trying to manufacture these things. So it is not good for the environment. It's not good for people's pockets. And we thought this would be a great uh, gift to, to everybody uh, that they can save money. And by the way, this batterizer uh, will suck the energy out of your battery, and then you can replace the battery. Don't, don't throw your... Uh, batterizer away because you can reuse it. This is a reusable sleeve that uh, you can use it as many as battery if you're careful. Maybe you can use it even 20, 30, 40 times. Dr. Bob, it says here, I'm reading um, a note from my um, spec sheet. More than 78 million U.S. homes use on average 28 battery-operated devices per household, including remotes, game controllers, toys, portable radios, and small appliances. I, I, I kind of feel that in my household alone, we have 78 million um, portable <laughs> devices that use batteries. At the, the rate that the kids come to me, I mean, you name it, I'm sitting here buying AA and AAA, kind of stocking it up. And I'm sitting here like, oh, my goodness, this stuff, you know, and I – I'm kind of stuck because I think about the amount of time I get to use my wireless remote. I mean, I mean my wireless mouse. And when the battery runs out, I'm like, that's it. It's over. There's nothing else I can do with this. And 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 it's. I, I think it's. I think it's a really great thing what you're doing. I really appreciate the encouraging word. And as as, as I mentioned, uh, you know there are. In U.S. alone, you're right. There are 78 million households. On the average, uh, uh, about 5.4 billion battery-operated devices exist around the world, and uh, and this is this is a growing market, by the way. Our value proposition is that we extend the life of the battery, we enhance the user experience because if you're sitting and using your remote and it's working sporadically and you you don't have to get closer and closer to TV for it to work. Uh, if you have a toy uh, and you put it in choo-choo train and choo-choo train doesn't start uh, getting slow down to the point that you throw the battery away, or if you put it in your flashlight, for example, the, the light doesn't get dimmer and dimmer, and then you have a constant bright light. So it does enhance the user experience uh, because it, the device will perform much, much nicer and it's environmental friendly as well. I mean, we just talked about the, the environmental friendly aspect of it as well. So people will save money. It's convenient because you don't have to make as many trips to your grocery store or your favorite store to, to pick up more batteries. And uh, it's, it's also uh, convenient in terms of not, uh, you know, getting and polluting the air uh, by driving to, to, to the store because you just want to pick up some more batteries. So, 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 so,
No, you're coming back really, really bad. Oh, okay. okay. Let me call you back. Do you want? Okay, Dr. Bob just dropped off for a second. I guess it's my usual. There's a certain part in the show that I'm on with my MacBook where um, the connection at some times can become, you know, I don't know, kind of questionable. Dr. Bob, can you hear me? Oh, I can hear you very nicely now, loud and clear. Oh, okay. Okay, very good. So I, I wanted you to tell us about the the device itself. The device itself is intelligent voltage management uh, device, which basically uh, deliver it's a it's a power delivery mechanism that uh, it extracts all the all the energy out of your battery. Uh, it's made of a micro thin stainless steel. Uh, that gives less than 0.1 millimeter, which is extremely thin, uh, to the thickness of the battery. It slips over your battery, and it fits neatly inside the battery compartment. So you can just put the sleeve over the battery and stick the battery with the sleeve inside the compartment. And this is just like, this is the, the, the one that it boosts the voltage from whatever the voltage happened to be. If If the battery voltage drops to... Uh, you know, 1.3, it will bring it back up to 1.5. It drops to 1 volt, it still boosted to 1.5. It goes to 0.8 volts, it will boost it to 1.5. And that's long before you, you, you know, around 1.3 volts, your battery are declared dead in most uh, applications. So this will go ahead and continue operation uh, till 0.5. Our, our IC power management uh, device will, will work all the way to 0.5. And uh, it's a patent pending technology. We have talked to the patent uh, office. They assured us that uh, we will be getting our patent within the next few months, so uh, we're looking forward to it. Uh, the result is that we typically, you know, can extend the life of the battery. Again, you know, it depends if you happen to be in a very, very cold environment, uh, you know, the, the number could be higher. Uh, but if you happen to be in a hotter place, uh, if you're using different types of batteries, uh, different brand, all those will have different effect on uh, the life extension. But uh, somebody was telling me that battery companies are going to be upset. Uh, I said, well, I'm going to have millions and millions of people around the world to be happy, and that's what we're trying to do. Oh, I definitely understand. The battery companies, Duracell and Energizer, I, I, I'm telling you, <laughs> They're gonna have your picture up there with, on, on a you know the company dartboard. <laughs> <laughs> there are friends that they don't walk next to me as we walk in the street, or because they they think I'm I'm a liability now because they said you know if if a bullet comes they don't want to be near me. <laughs> I'm just joking. Oh, definitely before. not. <laughs> oh my uh, goodness, Doctor Bob, yeah. tell us some some other. Um, is there, I believe, are there any other inventions that you're currently working on, or is this the, you know, is this, this is the latest. Your, your, uh, this yeah, is your this latest, is latest, like, kind of, okay. Yeah, this is the latest baby that we're working. My brother, uh, Frankie Rupovar, uh he he is an inventor of uh, the batterizer himself, and uh, I'm the I'm the I'm his partner. I. You know, he has over 500 patents under his belt. Uh, so I don't talk about me having uh, a numerous, numerous number of patents in, you know, in tens and twenties and thirties. When, you know, when he's having 500, I told him that he needs to get into the Guinness Book of Record. Uh, he was uh, the CEO of uh, a company called Sky Air that was successfully sold to uh, uh, Western Digital. And uh, he was also one of the founder of uh, a company called Micron Quantum that they came up with non-volatile flash memory. Uh, consequently, Micron Technology, the biggest DRAM company in the world, uh, acquired them. And so he became an executive in Micron, for worked for them for 19 years. And as you know, uh, 
almost half of the revenue of Micron is coming from the NAND flash that uh, was designed and uh, created by my brother Frankie. So, uh, yeah, he's, he's, he's a co-founder and chairman of the board. Oh, my goodness. Fantastic story. Dr. Bob, we want to say, well, I guess my first question, my last question is, if I wanted to know more uh, details and, and more data, do you have that online anywhere for, for anyone to, you know, further edu educate themselves? Absolutely. We have, uh, we, we're trying to uh, post uh, as much information as possible on our website. Uh, we're going to launch an Indigo camp, Indigo Go campaign, uh, which is a crowdfunding site uh, by June 22nd. And there's going to be a lot of information. We have, for example, uh, we have uh, made a, uh, a video showing a Apple wireless keyboard uh, having the two use battery in it, showing about 12 percent, 13 percent energy left in it. And then uh, in one continuous shot, we'll go and put the batterizer with the same old batteries and put it in there and the fuel gauge and on Mac Airbook, uh, it, it shows that it has 100%. So it, it is amazing that uh, this technology, uh, it, can, it can extract all the, all the energy that is being untapped and make it available to, to, to the device so you don't have to uh, go and buy battery all the time. I, I, I guys, tell you, I tell you, if there's a, the next specific project you can work on, is how to extend the battery life of my mobile phone. <laughs> that is for sure. <laughs> that is something that we are targeting to work on as soon as uh, the low-hanging fruit is to go after this uh, uh, 15 billion uh, batteries that are sold every year. That that would be a tremendous saving to the environment. Uh, at least uh, the rechargeable battery. They're not finding their way to the landfill as quickly as these uh, disposable batteries. So we thought that we should just go and focus on that. And, yes, uh, we have a lot of great ideas on rechargeable batteries as well. Dr. So Bob, stay, I want to thank you stay, so you got to stay tuned. <laughs> okay. Dr. Bob, I want to thank you so much. I want to give you a round of applause. Thank you so much. Dr. Bo Dr. Bob Rupar, we want to definitely have you come back here because we, I mean, just from this discussion alone, we know you're going to be working on the next greatest, you know, invention out there. We want to stay close to you. So thanks so much for joining us. Yeah. And the Princess Papa. Joanne, how are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm so happy to be here. I finally got to talk to you, Ted. Oh, I, I, same here. I, I really appreciated your emails and, and, and corresponding through, you know, electronically, but that's why, I, if you notice, I ended most of my um, emails by saying, hey, if you want to talk, give me a call. Give me a call. <laughs> yeah, you did. <laughs> <laughs> but, and thank I, you for I, that invitation. <laughs> oh, please, please. <laughs> I want to start off by saying um, thanking you not only for taking a few minutes of your time tonight live with us to join us, but I wanted to thank you for the re um, the book I received in the mail. I mean, oh, a yeah, lovely I like book. It. <laughs> so I good. really did like it. I really did like oh. it. Um, and, oh, and I'm not yeah. just saying that I liked it because, Joanne, if I didn't like it, boy, I, I would let you know. I would. I, I would. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but That's a like it's the a truth, fan huh? <laughs> Yes, it's a fantastic book. Fantastic oh, good. book. I'm so happy to hear that. Oh, um, good. I read it. It's really more for daddy and daughter because the the yes. wonderful story of how daddy and daughter bond together. Exactly. Um, and but here, here's here's the deal. My son now my son is eight years old and my daughter is okay. thirteen. So these type of books I used to read to my daughter. So when I'm reading okay. it, you know, my son and I are reading it together, and he's looking at me like, um, okay. <laughs> but but I, I'm going to decrease, and I'm allow you to increase. Tell us about who you are, 
tell us about the book, your inspiration for the book. The floor is yours, Joanne. Oh, okay. Thank you again, Ted, for having me. But I'm originally, I'm living in California, and I'm originally from Ohio, where I grew up with my mom and dad. I have nine sisters, and so my dad was always the hero in my eye. And so writing was something also, also that I was always interested in doing, and the stories that would just go on around our house. But growing up and moving and getting married and having my own children, I would think back about my relationship with my dad, and then now I look at the relationship of my daughters with their dad, who looks at their dad like a hero. And so that's kind of like how the idea and the concept of Prince Sam, Princess Papa came in, you know, came into my head, you know. And like you said, you read the book, and you can see that Princess, she really adores her dad. And and in her eyes, she's just a little girl of five, but everything good and nice comes in a frilly package, ribbons, bowls, smelly stickers, you name it. And so she uses Princess Papa to, you know, as her, her protege and also to show him appreciation for the things that, um, you know, he does for her. So it's really also a book that kind of like uh, promotes family unity, um, admiration between the father and the daughter bond because it's a strong one. And um, and that's how she sees Princess Papa. He's a hero in her eye. So together in a secret world they go to the aid of other people who needs who needs help until the day comes when Princess ends up being someone who needs of help and Princess Papa has to rescue her. And then also um, my inspiration for the book, like I said, is it's kind of a secret tribute to my own dad because um, I, although I never dressed him up in ribbons and bowls, but he was always <laughs> the, <laughs> he was always the bravest thing around, the strongest. I mean, he could always rescue no matter what was going on, and so. He kind of like was a natural hero in my in my own eye. So just being inspired by his memories, again, watching history repeat itself, I was fortunate enough to marry uh, someone who t- took fathering seriously and very patiently and lovingly, and he allows my daughters to do that to, um, to him. We have um, two girls. They're twins. They're 11 years old now, and they still do sparkly days with Dad because, <laughs> actually, they originated really? it. And so, yeah. So, you know, so it was fun. It was easy to come up with the um, – idea of the two and to partner up the two as a team and create a loving relationship because it's something that's really been a lot of part of my own life. Um, Joanne, I'm going to take the gloves yeah. off now. I'm going to take the gloves okay. off because we, we now have the warm and fuzzy feeling. And <laughs> uh-huh. I, I I know you wanted to know in advance were there any questions I can potentially have. And I held back personally for this to say, where did, where did you come up with Ratty Robert from? <laughs> well, we needed a villain. We needed a villain. And so um, just to personify his personality, instead of just calling him Robert, <laughs> I wanted everybody to know that he was kind of naughty. And so, like, you know, in the in the mind and in the eye of a little kid, like, you know, a little kid five, you know, somebody's a rat, you know, they can't be very nice. And <laughs> and since Prince Air, per se, don't really like boys, you know, I just kind of like, chose the name Ratty Robert. <laughs> other than that, you know, he didn't come from any real char- real person that I knew or any other little kid that I knew, but he's purely imagination, and I just kind of, like, wanted to make sure that his character and the kind of little kid he was, you know, was, you know, well-known when you just call his name. Oh, he must be a villain, Ratty Robert. <laughs> kind of like, uh, like, like, like Cruella DeVille. <laughs> Everybody know, ah, oh, she's not that nice. And so that's kind of like how I came up with um, Ratty Robert, you know, just to personify that personality. I, Joanne, i got to ask you about some of the business behind um, the Chronicles of, of Prince Aya and and Princess Papa. i got to ask you. Okay. So tell me, and, 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 and here's some of the business-related questions. Tell me, how okay. long did it take you to write a, a, a wonderful children's book like this? Well, you know, Ted, actually, this is a series. I've actually written five adventures for Prince Sam, Princess Papa, and this is the first in the series. In fact, my second story is, is planned to debut the 1st of January, 2016. So I'm going to say probably before all, you know, all the stories have been written now, um, I'm going to say probably from the start to now, even though the other ones aren't published, I'm going to say I'm, prob- I'm nearly two years in, and I actually got the first book published. So I'm nearly about, not not... 
ooh, I'm going to say shy maybe about three or four months of two years in. So, so do you, would you estimate or would you predict that, okay, so now that you've gone through it the first time, you cut your teeth on the whole publishing process and, 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 right. and, you know, publishing your book, that the next go around or, you know, books two through five are going to be that much smoother. Um, so like kind of walk us through what did you have, like what were some of the pain points you ran into being, being uh, you know, publishing your book? Well, um, when I first wrote this story, well, quite naturally I wanted to be traditionally published, um, and I know that's kind of difficult to do uh, these days, especially with diversity being a, being a problem. And um, so, you know, I just decided, well, I'm going to just go ahead and do it myself because when you self-publish, you know, you're your you're head man in charge. You know, you can do it when you want, how you want, and call all the shots. And so I just kind of like – just took it, you know, pieced it apart, looked at everything that I would need as far as the illustrations and the editor and that kind of thing. And I, um, uh, after they were all written, of course, and then I uh, just kind of like took it from there. And so um, it wasn't very difficult. You know, I didn't have a really difficult time doing it. You know, I'm not, I'm not done yet. I still have books two through five to get out. So I'm still learning. It's a learning process as I go. But, um, it wasn't very. It was challenging, of course, and you know. But like you say, now that I've gotten my teeth in, and I, you know, you know, you get the first thing done, the uh, the rest of follow is always somewhat easier. So I'm just kind of like looking forward to it being easier. And um, as I go on, if I'm fortunate enough to be picked up by a traditional publisher, and I can finish the other books and have them all out there. Okay, so so now that you did it, you did it your way. The first one, mm-hmm. you pre- you you would prefer. It. Books two through five, the, the, the remainder of the series to do it the, the traditional way of being picked up. Um, I got I got to ask you this question, and I, I I don't want you to feel uncomfortable because we okay. both of us on the line both of us on the line we're both African Americans. Where are the right. African American public um, authors? What, what's what's happening with that? Well, you know, diversity as a whole, you know, they're not they're not just picked up as quickly and as readily as um uh books of, with um animals or uh or children that, you know, uh you know, when is it? Uh, African American children, the children of color. They're just so many fewer books. So African Americans in general, we kind of like have a, a a difficult time being picked up by traditional publishers. Another reason what made me think, you know, Perhaps I should just go ahead and try to do this myself because then I don't have to worry about that. And at the still at the same time, go ahead and get my book out there. Whereas, like now, self-publishing, you know, I think it's going to be the wave of the future. You know, and as far as African American goes, with that, um, it's an avenue. It's a it's a it's a it's a crack in the door for more of us to get our books, children of color, out there to let them know that you know that. Our stories are just as interesting, imaginative, and, and, and need to be shared as the others. So, you know, um, that was a little bit of that was a little bit of a challenge. Not that I um, actually um, presented it to them, but it was the thing that held me back. I thought I'd do it this way first and kind of like get my feet wet and just you know just to see what would happen. But on diversity. Uh, you know, we raise the awareness. Awareness creates change. It might be slow, but it does take place eventually. Okay, okay. But I, I do want to commend you on a couple of things, um, Joanne. Okay. The fact that, number one, it was, you know, this book is no different than anyone else's book that you can right. find anywhere, whether I, oh, I go to Barnes & Noble's, whether I go oh, online and purchase my books uh, on Amazon, and I, I want to let you know, top rate editing that you've done on it. Um, the, oh, the, thank so the you overall so much. O- overall illustration, the visualization behind it was was also top notch. And, and I got to tell oh. you this much: you, you shared a very positive um, impression of your life within this book, because I, I can oh. basically say. How Joanne was raised, and, and I, I was I was kind of moved by it because I was I was sitting oh, there, wow. I was reading it. I read it by myself at first before I read it with uh-huh. my son, 
And uh-huh. I said, okay. I, I said, um, I can see where this is going because I, I truthfully think nowadays, I, I, and we, I might be veering off a little bit, so if you need to put me back in line, it's okay. But I, I, I have a need to say that we need more books like this. We need more positive role models, especially yes, not do. just in all, you know, yes, all lives do matter, but especially black lives that that matter and the fact yes. that, you know, people are so quick to say, oh, it's a single family home or it's this. Right. This. I, grew, I grew up with two parents. I grew up with yes. two parents. You grew up with two parents. Exactly. You had a father Absolutely, yes. who worked and, and broke his behind. Yes. Yes, he did. And, and 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 for some reason, that seems to get lost in some of the lyrics that are put out there, in, in some of you know, in the music and the culture. So I want to commend you on that, on a job well done for this. Thank you kindly. I, I was, I was right really, it really proud. Oh, thank you so much. It means a lot to hear you say that. So so, tell me tell me this much. Why? I mean, so what do we have to do? How do we, how do we start this? I, I mean, or how do we continue this so that we have more books out here like this? How do we? I mean, this is this is a process that you've seen over your lifespan. What is what are some thoughts on your behalf? Well, you know, um, we got to teach. We, you know, like I said, it needs to be taught. You know, like I said, now with our with our young, you know, like say for instance, my daughters who are eleven, I can encourage them to become. Writers, I can encourage them to let their voices be heard. And now today, really, we don't really have an excuse with the Internet. You know, before it was almost like we were closed out. But with um, self-publishing, you know, with, 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 the, with the blog, the voices can, you know, voices can be heard. And, and when you hear a voice, you don't necessarily see a, a color, you know. But that's a, it's an avenue um, where we can, we can get in and more people of color should, you know, should should write and just just put their thoughts and their imaginations and their ideas out there, and um, pretty soon I think you know it may take some time, but it will it'll you know it'll help create the change that's necessary, and um, um, you know and then like I said we can have more we can have more of a share you know and again share the things that we've learned uh, our stories our lives because every life like you said it matters and it has an interesting story to share. Definitely, definitely. I, I, I like I said, Joanne. Um, I'm going to go on a limb right now and say, right here, you're welcome. As you release the remaining four four books within your series, you have an open door to come on the show and talk about oh. each and every book because this is what we need. Oh, how wonderful! Thank you for that. I appreciate that. <laughs> I'd be delighted. No problem. To. <laughs> I was no looking, problem. so looking forward to it. <laughs> so, 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 give us, give us the business behind um, the Chronicles of Princea and, and, and Princess Papa. Where do we get it? Um, how much does it cost? Um, um, you know, tell us that type okay. of stuff. Okay. Well, it's available now um, through every like online retailer: Amazon.com, Ingram, Baker and Taylor, uh, Barnes and Nobles. And then you can even it can even be ordered directly from the publishers at outskirtspress.com slash bookstore. It does come in paperback and, as well as hardback. The paperback is nine ninety five and the hardback is seventeen ninety five. Um also um my website is uh, uh www dot com outskirtspress dot com web I'm sorry, web web page slash ISBN and that number is Nine seven eight one four seven eight seven five five two eight nine. So it can be ordered directly from the publishers, or again, any other um, um, online retailer dis- distributor. Okay, that's excellent. And like I said, um, tomorrow your blog goes live with uh, oh, wow. a, a, a brief a brief overview of your book. Um, also. There's going to be a link to this specific interview here, so that you can okay. share amongst your friends. And oh, I want, I I don't want to put you on the spot, but I'm going to put you on the spot because this is a children's yeah. book. I I yeah. want us to be able to potentially um, do a giveaway. 
with with um, okay. your book, if you're okay with that. Yes. Okay. I, thank you so much because, I, I mean, like I said, I had a great time reading it. I my my son himself read it. You, you know, we read oh, it together, okay. and it but it but it reminded me of the time that I spent with my daughter when she was much much younger. So oh. um, thank you for taking me down memory lane. Oh, you're you're quite welcome. Be sure to get on Amazon and put a it gives me that put that review in there. <laughs> I definitely will. I definitely will. So, um, with let's see, with that we're gonna say. So hey, you're on Twitter. Give us your Twitter address yeah. or give us give us give us your Twitter address so we can stay in contact. Okay, that's uh, Family Values Fund at Twitter. want to talk about is ignorance ruining your retirement. Uh, I want to talk about three financial sm- mistakes you should avoid during your golden years. So, I mean, I'm in my mid forties. I haven't touched those, you know, twilight years yet, but I'm reaching out for them. And I got to tell you, I think about retirement every day. Yes. For my current employer, for my future employers, I do think about it. I think about it every day. And I don't know if there's a problem with, or not with that. But the question is, is ignorance ruining your retirement? So I want to go through three financial mistakes, common mistakes to avoid when retiring, because I think about it, you know, Americans are part of an amazing yet curious phenomenon. Most are extremely well educated in their professions and their careers yet are quite uneducated when it comes to the purpose behind their jobs, which is money. So our our society is kind of awash in information about money, but most people still end up making decisions based on emotion and lack of, you know, accuracy, correct and complete information. You know, you got to think about it because this type of stuff wouldn't matter so much if our retirements weren't on the line. So I just want to go through an example of just some pitfalls people face when it comes to money. And these are the three common mistakes uh, they make when planning to fund retirement. The first one is failure to educate oneself. So you got to think about it. You know, if I'm a financial planner, um, which I am not, but I'm going to say, you know, the average client, you know, the person looking to meet with a financial planner has a full schedule. They have a demanding job, a fulfilling family, and barely enough time left over to eke out a morning jog or catch a favorite TV show after a busy weekend. You know, we all like to squeeze squeeze in fun when we can, if we can, but that doesn't mean it's wise or prudent to continue putting off retirement planning or even educating ourselves on it. So you got to think about it. Is it. You're looking for a solid base and financial education is essential for having a good retirement. So you got to start small with something like Barron's or Investor's Business Daily. Try going to some of these websites, signing up for, let's say, like a daily newsletter. You know, and don't fall for a well-hyped headline especially if you don't understand the logistics of a strategy or a product. You know, one size does not fit all. So be wary of any silver bullet, you know, financial solutions. And don't be afraid to start from scratch. This way you can understand money the right way. Um, option number two is sleepwalking without pain, without a plan. And, and it happens to all of us sometimes. You know, we simply haven't prioritized forward thinking. We think about the now. We think about current state. We're not thinking about future state. You know, most people that I sit down and I talk to, they can tell you about the now. I can tell you about what's happening today, next week, maybe towards the end of the month, and maybe they might you can you can the only thing in future thinking that you can think about is if you and your loved ones schedule like a vacation or that you're going out of town to go see a a, a loved one or something like that, or like, you know, there's specific holidays coming up. Hey, I know it's our turn to host 
Thanksgiving dinner or something, you know, but it happens to all of us. You got to prioritize. You got to forward think. And for retirement, waiting um, into this period without a plan is going like to to the beach and neglecting your, your bathing suit, your towel and your sunscreen. If you're approaching this stage in your life with no plan, then there's no use kicking yourself now. Now is the time to formulate a sensible and realistic plan. You got to think about this stuff. I mean, I wouldn't say I'm not a financial planner, but I would start, get yourself a whiteboard, you know, and you start thinking. And, and, and if, if I just take a, a step away from this, these three items that we're talking about for retirement, just think about your, your daily life. Um, so at my desk at home, which I will take a picture of, has all different types of post-it notes and everything on it, a calendar, the, you know, the kids' pictures. But that's some of the stuff that I can put up there because I can keep it on my mind. But it's not good to sleepwalk without a plan. You got to be realistic. You have to formulate a sensible and realistic plan. Understand your money and your assets and read up on how you might be able to, to use them. Here, you know, the help of professional advice could prove, you know, absolutely invaluable. A professional may see the opportunity where you cannot as a layperson. You know, so a good first step in formulating your plan is having a strategy that's designed to preserve your wealth. Hey, folks, you got to think about it. We could sit here and talk about the 1% and we're the 99%, you know, but it's about your retirement. You know, this is only going to happen once. Um, the third option is an inability to fully appreciate diversification. So even though people have learned this lesson over and over again, starting in grade school, Many still put all their eggs in one basket one way or another. You got to think about it. You know, if you have your, your, your 401k, how do you have it set up? Did you set it up the right way? Because you, you sit there and you look at it and you say, oh, okay, I have uh, $1 million in there and I'm, I'm fully vested. Okay, you know, you should review this type of stuff. So there's this is especially problematic with, with finances, putting all your eggs in one basket. I mean, I know it's a, an old term, but what's the harm in sticking with one financial product if, if it's working? Many people thought the same way before 2008. A financial portfolio is more diversified among different investment and insurance products that may reduce um, or minimize your loss during an economic meltdown. So the key to it is spreading your investments across various asset classes. You know, and it kind of refers to, you know, a bunch of investments or a bunch of assets that are grouped by their, their similarities. You know, these classes include large cap, small cap, mid cap, high yield, international, domestic, and again, just remember, professional advice in this and other areas and other arenas, too, are advisable. You got to think about this. This is your nest egg. So I always think it's good. It's the new year. You should get with a financial plan or you should get with someone that can tell you how they're going to help you. I mean, you got to be careful of the people that are going to swindle you. But look, do your homework, look at some reputable um, planners in, in these various places, the Better Business Bureau. You got you to gotta, you gotta take the time out to do it because it's not going to help you. It's not only now, but it's in the long run when you're in your late 60s. And hopefully, you know, nowadays, I mean, today's economy, we're working well into our 60s. So hopefully you've done the right thing over the years. 
Um, we don't want you to ruin your retirement. You got to be smart. We're going to do a blog about this. We're going to talk about this. We're going to make this uh, a piece. We're going to make this a blog, and we're going to include the audio in here. We feel really, really strong about it. Common mistakes to avoid when retiring. I'm not at the retirement age, but I got to tell you, as I said, I think about it every day, not a day at all. So with that, we're going to get ready to close out. Like I said, we have so many.